are just the heartbeat of the city and everyone loves it. And they'll do things like they'll call you when they get your favorite book in, or they'll call you when a special author is coming and say, hey, we thought you'd like to know about this event going on because they know their readers and they care about you. They love the new people coming into town and it's just a great meeting place to come to the bookstore. So we've always loved Page and Palette and we appreciate them sponsoring this tonight. And now we would like to talk about someone that we all love, and that would be someone named Fanny Flack. Oh. I just happened to have this picture on my desk where I write, is that any wonder I'm inspired? This is actually my father's picture, and I wrote a story for the newspaper about how he and Fanny Flagg went back and forth teasing each other, and she wrote, um, thank you for the great time in Panama City in 1957, P.S. Our son is now 34 years old. <laughs> and I told her this, that she didn't know it. She didn't know at the time, but my dad was a Baptist minister. And so he kept, he kept the picture in his office next to my mother's small picture. And so when he passed away a few years ago, I told my mother, the only thing I would like to have out of daddy's office is the picture of Fanny Flagg. And she said, you know, the deacons were coming over and I hid it because I didn't think they were coming. So, so we had to tear that office apart, finding where that woman had hit Fanny Flagg. So, anyway, so I have it now, so that's good. Oh, but that's um, hilarious. Fanny Flagg was one of these children. You know, I used to teach school and some children are just born with this incredible gift of creativity. And in the fifth grade, Fanny Flagg wrote and directed and starred in her very own play called The Whoopie Girls which I always want to pronounce it, whoopee girls. And so she took off from there. And when she was 19 years old, she started writing for television and producing television shows. And I know 19 year olds who don't know how to hang up towels. So <laughs> this is just very impressive. she's incredibly intelligent, dripping with creativity and Southern charm, which gets you a long, long way, I found. So we just love her. And we also, I also have another show and tell. One of her, her first book was one of my favorites, um, Daisy Faye and the Miracle Man. And I laughed so hard reading this book. There's another story I won't tell you, but I literally fell out of the bed onto the floor laughing so hard. And my husband from New Jersey doesn't understand Southern humor. And he stuck his head under the bed and said, what are you doing? Which made it even funnier. I was like, ooh! <laughs> so anyway, I love that story, but she also wrote something you may have heard of called Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe, mm -hmm. Welcome to the World Baby Girl, A Redbird Christmas, Can't Wait to Get to Heaven, I Still Dream About You, The All Girl Filling Station's Last Reunion, The Whole Town's Talking, and the only one I don't have is the original Whistle Stop Cafe cookbook, so I'm going to have to check that out and find a copy of that. And of course, tonight we know that she has a new book. This is The Wonder Boy of Whistle Stop. And we'll be talking a lot about that in just a minute. But the neat thing about tonight is not just that we have someone amazing like Fanny Flagg, but we also have five outstanding authors who are the heroes of the Southern fiction literature genre. They cover my bookshelves. And so it's fun to see their faces here tonight instead of sitting on my bookshelf. But tonight we have... <laughs> my fictional hero writers of Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe. And together, they are known as the superhero group of the Fab Five. They host, they host, I want to see some costumes next time. I think some cake. Yeah. And food. <laughs> This oh, is a real really missed nice. opportunity. I like that. There We're dressed. This is our costume. Whenever there's an opportunity for a costume, take it. Mm -hmm. All right. So they um, host a weekly live web show and podcast called Friends in Fiction, where they welcome distinguished guests like Delia Owens, Kristen Hanna, Ellen Hildebrand, and Sue Mike Kidd. You can join them on their Friends in Fiction Facebook group. So remember that Friends in Fiction on Facebook. And you can see their weekly show live on Facebook Live, Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern. And now that there's COVID, I know you're not at prayer meeting on Wednesday night eating dinner on the ground, so you can tune into this on Wednesday night. It's at 7 p.m. Eastern time, Facebook Live. And also, if you like to listen to the podcast, they have the podcast Friends in Fiction on all the major podcasting platforms. So thanks for tuning in. 
And without further ado, I hand it over to Fanny and the Fab Five of Friends and Fiction. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, oh, Leslie you. Ann. I'm Mary Kay Andrews, and we are so thrilled um, to be here tonight um, because we get to meet the iconic Fanny Flagg and hear about her brand new book, The Wonder Boy of Whistle Stop. And we're going to ask her all the burning questions we've been dying to pose to her since we first got wind that we might possibly get to be part of an event like this with one of our favorite indie bookstores, Page and Pallet and Fairhope. Now, I'm especially personally thrilled because I, I know Fanny won't remember this, but I met and interviewed her almost 30 years ago when she was in Georgia filming Fried Green Tomatoes. I went down to interview her for a freelance story for People Magazine. And I'm sure she doesn't remember it, but as a beginning novelist and longtime fan, I remember it. And one thing I really remember is I got us lost. I was trying to get us to... Um, to um, a barbecue place in Noonan, Georgia, very famous barbecue place. We got so lost, we were s stopping the car and asking little children standing in the road. That was before GPS. Huh? It was well before anything. So uh, anyway, let's go ahead and we've, we've already talked about the mics. Patty Callahan Henry, you have the first question for Fanny. Why don't you lead off? All right, Miss Fanny. So. We've only met once, and it was at the crazy Pokewood Queen. That's right. Back in the day. Yeah. Yes. And um, I pretended to be you when you weren't logging on, because <laughs> we both have the first name of Patricia Patty. Yeah. And um, we're both, I live in Birmingham, yeah. and we are both Harper Lee Distinguished. Yes. Year. So I'm so happy. Congratulations, Patty. You're sweet, thank you. I'm so happy to see your face. Which I get to ask my favorite question because um, you know I know you're from Birmingham and I live in Birmingham, but I'm not from Birmingham. And we ask, we like to ask about the reading and writing values when you were growing up. So when you were in Birmingham, what were the reading and writing values around your home, and how do you think that influenced you as a writer now? Okay. Well, Patty, wonderful question. Before I start, I am honored to be with these beautiful, talented women. My gosh, what a group. And Paige and Pallet, uh, down in Fairhope, the bookstore was my first book signing. I had oh. the first, so it means a lot to me. And hello to Karen Wilson, love you. Uh, Patty, uh, I was living in a little apartment in Birmingham and I was like five years old. I was so lucky because my dad read a book to me and I don't know why, but he wanted to read a book to me and it was called Heidi. And it was about, oh. as you know, the little girl growing up in Switzerland and oh, it just took me away. And here I was in this little apartment in Birmingham and I was just tra traveling over to Switzerland and all oh, the, I could hear the goats and all of that and it just set me wild. So uh, that was my first experience. And uh, I'm just so forever thankful that my dad did that. <laughs> and then the second thing I would say is that in the sixth grade, I had a wonderful teacher who read to me and uh, at the class actually, and she read Nancy Drew. Oh, set me wild. So yeah. I would say. <laughs> I wanted to be but, Nancy Drew, yeah. Don't you? Oh, I love Nancy. Oh, yeah. So uh, basically, those those were the books that I grew up with, basically children's, you know, books and that. And um, my dad was a motion picture machine operator, so I saw an awful lot of movies, and um, a lot of those movies were back then from books. So I was lucky in my childhood because I had a lot of, um, inspiration around me. You were surrounded by story. You yes. were surrounded by it. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Hey, I want to remind everyone to mute yourself a couple of, we can hear people in the background. <laughs> and Christy, you've got a question, right? I yes. do. I sure do. So Fanny, not many authors can say that they are a New York Times bestseller and an Academy Award nominee, or that they've written a dozen books while also having a successful career in television, film, and theater. Blows my mind, wow. Um, but so my question is, of your many distinguished achievements, what accomplishment has meant the most to you personally? You know, I, I, 
I would have to be totally honest with you of all the things that, that I ever ac accomplished, which was, you know, uh, I, I haven't won that many awards, but the thing that absolutely me meant the most, does mean the most to me, uh, is something that Patty and I share, was when I won the Harper Lee Award, because it was from my hometown of, I mean, well, my state, and I always wanted to make my state proud of me. And she was a special person to me. Uh, I, I knew her, I met her in New York just as a, a serendipity. It was just luck that I met her. And it was at a time when I was trying to finish, trying to write fried green tomatoes and I was just not having any luck. I was, down, I was living in a little rat hole apartment trying to, finish it. I couldn't get a publisher or whatever. And I met her and we went, she asked me to go to dinner with her. And she said, what are you doing? And I told her and I said, I'm about to give up. And she said, don't give up on that. Mm -hmm. And she inspired me to keep going and gave me a blurb for the book, as we all know, <laughs> blurb from Harper Lee, it means anything. Yes. So to actually get that award, from her and she came to the to no the, way uh, yeah oh and it was the last time she appeared and i got to say hello to her and, and thank her for her her inspiration and so for me that is the best thing that ever that's just that's incredible what amazing story that's amazing. Wow. i have head to toe chills that's amazing oh that really um, I, I'm just aghast. I mean, I got t the two icons in, in Southern literature together. <laughs> That's right. Incredible. Wow. Mary Alice, you have a question for us. I do. I'm just a little bit cleft from that answer. So I'll try to gather myself together. Uh, I really loved this. First of all, I loved fried bean tomatoes in the Whiskey Cafe. I really, it, it was just the right time in my life when I read it. And I missed and longed for those characters. So I was so excited to see the Wonder Boy. And I was really interested in how you juggled the timelines. And you had... Buddy as the tent pole, and then Ruthie of all, and then you brought back all the beloved characters that we wanted to see, but it was so clever how you did that with the timeline. So I'm curious how you decided to do that and how you used that tent pole to and the timelines to bring all the characters to life. Well, thank you very much. But um, I was thinking when, when I first thought about writing the book and I thought, you know, how will I, it, as we all know, all of us here know, the hardest thing is to how do you start it? What voice do you use? And um, when they approached me about writing this, this book uh, as, a, as a, you know, whatever happened to, I had a vision and I'm sure we all have these, vi I had a vision of the little boy in the movie, as you remember, uh, he lost his arm. He was Ruth Jameson's son. And so I had this vision of this lady riding a train from Birmingham to New York and passing through the little town of Whistlestop. And this little boy running along the train, waving at her. And as they pass by, she turns to her husband and she said, I think that little boy back there had an arm missing. And she was just fascinated with him. And so every year at Christmas, when they'd go through this little town, she would turn to her husband and she'd say, I wonder whatever happened to that little boy with the one arm. And so yeah. I thought, okay, this is what the <laughs> is that. Whatever happened to that little boy? And right. then we go forward in time uh, to, he is an older man and has a daughter who is uh, the original Iggy Threadgood's niece. So uh, that's, that's basically how I started. And I, I write back and forth in time. And sometimes I'll have the, the middle, you know, somewhere here. And then I'll put, the, I'll put it on a close. I probably shouldn't tell this, but I put it on a clothesline. And I took ah, it. I love it. <laughs> it's a I great idea. Try to visualize your office. With it's, not, it's, it's not very, it's not very uh, you know, literary, I suppose, but uh, I'm, I am a little dyslexic, so I, I, I have a hard time with placement. So I just put them all together, and, and uh, if I ever drop the book, it's a different book. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you want to see I, a 
picture of that yeah. clothesline. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, I have a picture. But, you know, I love playing with time. I love that. Yeah. It's the yeah. only time we can do it because in yeah. real life, you know, all of us, we're stuck, you know. Uh, this is, today is the youngest I'm going to be. Tomorrow I'm going to be older. <laughs> and, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's a joy to be able to play with time and say, you know, what, what happened back then, what happened here. And Except on Leslie Ann's shelf. You're young and on her shelf. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to say, one of my favorite lines in the whole book was, as you're doing the timeline, and there's Buddy Threadgood, and he's in his 80s, I think, at this yeah. point. And he yeah. looks in the mirror and he goes, who is that old guy? That's <laughs> not me. I know how that feels. <laughs> Yeah, you go, isn't it true? In, in real life, I can remember the first time I, I went, I looked at my hand, I thought, oh my, that's my mother's hand. Yes. <laughs> it to look like my mother. Then, you know, then as you go older, you go, yeah, I look just like my grandmother. But not, <laughs> I'm headed to great grandmother, so I don't know. Thank you. Hey, Fanny, would you, you know, I, um, I remember I read, um, Daisy Fay. Before mm -hmm. I read, um, mm -hmm. I think most people found your books with uh, fried green tomatoes, yeah. and I can remember reading um, Daisy Fay, and and I think I must have read the author's note that said your father actually was a a movie operator. Mm -hmm. But then you know you go to uh, fried green tomatoes, and then Welcome to the World, Baby Girl. I wanted to move into that town where. Welcome to the world, baby girl. It was a kindler, gentle place. And then, um, you know, Redbird Christmas. You write a lot. Um, you take your readers a lot, it seems to me, to a kindler, kinder, gentler place. Um, it seems to me that um, nostalgia has a big place in your novels. I'm, I'm thinking, too, about the, um, the all-girl filling station. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And you do. I, I am I am so awed by your seamless, the seamless way you move back and forth. I can remember reading Fried Green Tomatoes, and I was writing my first novel at the time, and I thought, how did she do that? Yeah. Finally. Well, thank you. And by the way, I do remember that, and we finally got that barbecue. And I, you know what I remember? <laughs> like their barbecue sauce. You told her to go back and get Hickory Craft. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I it's I do I do write about uh, small communities and small towns and uh, people that are neighborly and pulling together. I think it's because it's what I long for. I grew up as an only child. And I always longed uh, for a big family. I always longed for a community. Uh, so I, I just wanted to go back to a, a time when we were closer together and people were kinder and, and it was, you know, it's, it is nostalgia. And they say, and I don't know if, if the gals will agree, they say, you know, most writers never get over their childhood. And uh, being uh, by myself in an apartment, I remember so well, um, live, I was living literally downtown in Birmingham, which was, as y'all all know, a big industrial city at that time with iron and coal and steel. And I can remember driving with my mom and dad down streets and neighborhoods and looking into houses and seeing the people inside and they look so happy and they look like they were having such a wonderful time. And I think that it's in a way, uh, me trying to get back to a place, that place that, that felt so wonderful. And, and the Whistle Stop Cafe, of course, was a real place. Right. And I think I wanted to go back there as well. I yeah. can remember that amazing set they built in Juliet, Georgia. Yeah. I'd, never felt, I'd never been on a movie set before, and I thought it was a town that they found. It was amazing. And, I, and the most amazing, that, well, first of all, let me say this. The fact that they would make a movie out of that book was, I couldn't understand how they could do it. They did right. it. And the, the fact that I was, that I, when I can remember, Mary, going off the, the uh, 
train or plane or however I got down there. And it was a Sunday and I walked by myself through that town. And it was like the most amazing thing to think that little town that I made up in my head all of a sudden was real. And then wow. the actors and actresses started walking around. It was just unbelievable. And the fact that I wrote a second book was a miracle. And I'll tell you, because y'all were all Southern, you'll understand this. I wrote that first book, which most people think Fried Green was the first book, but it wasn't. It was Daisy Faye and the Miracle Man, which was very autobiography. So uh, the, the, the amazing thing is uh, after I wrote that first book, I called my mother in Alabama and she said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I don't know, mama. I said, uh, I'm thinking I'd like to write a second book. And my mother, she paused and she said, well, honey, you wrote one. <laughs> <laughs> what else could you have to say? <laughs> well, honey, you did it once. You don't need to do it again. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. Done. Yeah, yeah. You've done it. You've done it. Yeah. Probably wanted you to go to back to television, Fanny. Yes. Yeah. She but wanted she to, to all her friends. That's my daughter up on that team. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's that's that fool yeah. in those t-shirts on Match Game. Yeah. <laughs> and you you were in the movie. You got a part. Yes, I was. I was glad cool. you said that. Yeah, it's so funny because I didn't, uh, uh, John Abnett, the great director who did it, did such a great job. He said, now you need to be in this movie. I said, oh no, I don't want to be in the movie. He said, oh, come on, just do a little bit. So I, he let me pick what I wanted to play. So I picked the romance teacher. So, <laughs> so I mean, I, if, if you, you know, you have to blink or you'll miss me, but I, I played the little romance yeah. teacher. Yeah. But I have to say too, there are movies and there are movies. That was a great movie oh, it, it it really stands up to time just like the novel does and you're thank that's you. it's just that barbecue scene wow <laughs> um, no, listen we got so lucky kathy bates was a friend of mine oh. and, you know, she was pr and i said please kathy you know uh be in this movie and she was just so good and mary, mary louise parker all everybody in that film they were so it was just so good Perfect. and the thing Perfect. that really that, that amazes me is the music that they picked is okay. so evocative mm -hmm. i think it just makes that it's i didn't realize how much m music puts mood in the mo in the movie and it, they did a beautiful job and i know a lot of writers have their mo uh, books made into films and they, they you know they don't like them but i i thought i was just over the moon by all those performances. Cecily Tyson was brilliant. Oh, was unbelievable as to see. And yeah. Jessica Tandy. Oh, oh yeah. Jessica yeah. Tandy, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I, I remember was, from that story I did? It was supposed to be about the food, all the food they prepared yeah. for the cafe and everything. Right. And I remember being told that um, Mary Stuart Masterson and um, the other gal, the other lead, that they Mary were- Mary Wilson. Yeah, that they were vegetarians. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, that they were like gagging during the barbecue scenes. They said, "You know, you all this barbecue," and they were like, eh. <laughs> they were "Vegetarians." Ew. <laughs> they must be from California. <laughs> was it true that was it true that Mary um, Masterson was um, the one who actually did the bee charmer? Yeah. Was, yeah, that's an amazing story. Well, let me tell you what's even funnier. Well, it's not funny. But first of all, I will tell you about Mary Louise, uh, I mean, Mary Stewart. Uh, her mom and dad were friends of mine. I was doing a play in, in New, a musical in New York City called Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, which my oh, mother referred, sure. I said warehouse, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Mary, Mary's uh, dad was the director and Carlin Glenn, her mother, was the the lead that I replaced. So I knew them and I knew her. And so oh. she, I had known her and I said, please cast her. And she was just terrific. Oh, but, she's perfect. Um, yeah. Oh. Yeah. And uh, so the B thing, I said, what are you going to do about the B thing? And they kept saying, well, we'll see, we'll see. And I felt so guilty. They did that scene the last scene of the thing that they shot. And I said, 
so you're like, if this girl gets bitten and dies, you'll still have a movie. That's not right. <laughs> oh, no. but they, had, they had a professional, this was fascinating. They had a professional bee person and they put smoke, some kind of smoke all over it and, and they hypnotized the bees. And so, you know, she was so brave to do that. I mean, she was covered. Oh yeah. yeah, she was at, and those were real. That that wasn't. Remember, was you know, back then they didn't do the thing. That was her. So I just don't know if I could have What's done that. that? I don't know if I could have done oh. it. Kristen mm -hmm. has a question. She is dying to get to you with Fanny. <laughs> it's actually kind of a good segue because you were talking before about how um, how music makes the movie, right? Like how music can play such an important role, and I think that in a book the way we tell the story, our, the, our writing style is sort of the music. And, and I felt that very much when I was listening to the audiobook of The Wonder Boy of Whistle Stop. It, it, I mean, it's told in your voice. Um, and obviously your actual physical voice is part of that, but you have such a distinctive writing voice too, that just eases us in and makes us feel like we've known you and known these characters forever. I mean, it's, um, it, it's incredible. And, you know, I think all of us as writers ourselves, you know, voice is so important. And when you see it done that well, it, it really is something. So um, I, I was curious, how did you find your voice as a writer and how, how have you managed to maintain it and keep it so real and so authentic for all these years? Um, well, I think one of the reasons that uh, the voice is so, that, that, that it, it's a real, real voice to me is that because uh, that, I, that I am dyslexic and I had a hard time reading and all that stuff, I listened very carefully to, to how people talked and accents. I'm fascinated with accents. And so when I am writing, I actually hear the, these people talking. And because I have been an actress, I'm, some, I'm somewhat of a mimic, and I hear them speaking through me. And uh, so the acting that, that I did worked out well for me to do the audio because I, I know what they sound like because I can hear them in my ear. Um, and it's, as we all know, uh, it's very important. And, and how, how many years have we had to suffer through movies where people are doing a fake Southern accent? Uh. <laughs> and you just go, oh no, you know, please, please. And so uh, I was so, I'm always wanting to get that authentic, Southern voice and Cajun, but because we have a way of speaking that is so different. It's almost like a different language, the way we use the, the language and it's lyrical because we are, Southerners are sort of love to talk storytellers. And I, I mean, the, the, it, just the, the, the most amazing things come out of just people that you'd never guess. I remember I was at a health spa and uh, this gal was doing a was going to do a massage, and she gave me a robe that was one of those terry. You remember those terry cloth robes they put on you? And it was old, and it was kind of worn. And she picked it up, and she looked at it, and she said, "Oh my!" She said, "This this robe is as thin as a bee's wing." Oh, wow! <laughs> I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> I know. It's just poetry. The way people use use the language, and so I've always been fascinated with with that. How, how the that K. It's 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 not so much. It's the inflection. There, you know, yeah. you can say a sentence, but it's it's the inflection and the importance you put on vowels and whatever, whatever. And uh, so I think because I I did struggle so with with school and all of that, and um, that that I had to listen much more carefully than other people. But um, it, I think uh, you know. I love dialogue. Sometimes uh, I have too much dialogue. I have to go back and put some plot in. <laughs> it's annoying when you have to stick plot in there. <laughs> oh, I hate that. I, I hate a plot. I like to just yeah, you know, just, just character it up. Plot. I'm the same, Fanny. I'm like, why do we need a strip? Let's just talk about the characters. Plot. Yeah. 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 Let's just know how they feel. I yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah. Patty's into feelings. I am into <laughs> talking. Yeah. Yes. Hey, would you, 
you told us that you're a great mimic and I am so old that I remember you on Candid Camera. I do. Can you tell us your favorite uh, person to mimic? I know you do some great imitations. Oh gosh. Well, uh, I would, here's, here's the thing about, you know, just luck. I mean, I was some kid from Birmingham, Alabama, wound up in New York, and I just was uh, so lucky. I, w I lucked into things, you know. Uh, I was doing, I was writing a comedy for Candid Camera, and some friends of mine on that show, the writers, said, we're doing a comedy album uh, about the first family, which was at that time Lady Bird Johnson and That's Lyndon what I Johnson. Remember. And we got ready to record, and I was over at the recording studio, and the actress who was supposed to play Lady Bird didn't show up. And, and here we had the studio, and they looked at me, and they said, can you do that? And I said, well, I, I don't know. Let me, and I ran down to the uh, record store, and I listened to her, and I went, I can do that, because I, it, it was, I picked up something that, about her. Years ago, when young ladies uh, went to school, they took elocution. Right. And when you do that, particularly the Southern uh, people, they say, think before you speak. Just don't blah, 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 blah. So Lady Bird Johnson would say, hi, and a hello to you. Oh, how proud I am to be here on behalf of a more beautiful America. Oh my so gosh. It was again, again, you know, it's pattern and, and, and inflection. And so I was able to do that. But um, yeah, I do. I do love to mimic. Perfect her. imitation. Thank you. <laughs> she was love. By the way, I got to meet her. She's love a so lovely, just a lovely person. Yeah. But we're grateful for all the flowers she planted across the south. Yeah, well, you know, they don't give her credit. She was one of the they first don't. environmentalists in the country. Yeah, yes, she was. And yeah. she was the one that, I think, got them into the radio station business, too. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Leslie Ann, are we going to open this up to some viewer questions that we're going to read? Yes. Along? I think so. I'm able to see parts of the questions on the bottom of the screen that the readers are sending in, but I can't see the full question. So if you can tell me how to see all of them, we can get them. But I've been jotting down notes while I'm looking for that. I know a lot of people chimed in about Iggy Threadgood, the character, being their favorite. And they mm -hmm. wanted to know more about that character and maybe... Oh, okay. She, uh, she was based on... Uh, as I t said earlier, I, I was uh, raised mm -hmm. in Birmingham, but my Correct. mother had a great aunt who lived in this little railroad town right outside of Birmingham called Irondale. Y'all y'all know where that is. And she would sometimes take me out there and my Aunt Bess ran that cafe. And she was the character. She was hilariously funny. She was kind of like the mayor of the town. And she was just, she was just, uh, a real uh i don't know i guess pioneer gal it, she had her own business she was just independent and funny and cute and so i i based it on her and uh you know so of course of course uh i have to disclaim her they didn't they didn't barbecue anybody <laughs> i made that up <laughs> well that's good to know <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's good, good to know, but uh, so that that's basically, and most of the people that I write about are based on uh, people that I have met, people I know, and they're, as we all know, they're combo uh, of different people, combo, you know, of different people and uh, that, that I've met, different types of people, and um, you know, basically real people, uh, because um, that's the, one of the things I did learn working on Candid Camera is that there is nobody or funnier than somebody that doesn't know they're being funny. Yes. I mean, they just throw me in the floor. People are, to me, hilarious. That yes. when they don't know how funny they really are. People that try to be funny, I don't find as funny. Yes. And uh, I find, I find, and I read, just so you know, I read an awful lot of small town newspapers. And 
Uh, yeah, oh. and, and the society pages, what, what people do, um, it, it's a scream. I remember uh, reading, and I think I put it in a book, it, in some small town, some woman got mad at her husband because he was running around on her and she attacked him in the front yard with shrubbery well that <laughs> on the floor she was picking picking bushes up and throwing it oh and, and i just put it in you know that you can't make that up you just cannot make it up <laughs> well i i've learned how to see the comments now but i have to say that's i when i started writing i became a very good eavesdropper uh -huh. yes, because that's mm -hmm. the best it's not the conversation you're having it's the conversation at the next table so. exactly exactly well okay i can remember uh going into a lady's room once in i think it was in atlanta i was in atlanta and i walked in and there was a young woman sitting in a chair and as I walked in, she, she looked at me and she said, I'll never date another Greek man as long as I live. <laughs> and I thought, I, I've never, I've never gotten, you know, the things people say, it's, it's just, it's it's true. of course, I don't know why, but it's just too funny. Well, well that's the best part. We can make it up. Why? Yes. Yeah. You yeah. hear it and then you get to make up why they said it. Yeah. 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 Susan has touched on a comment. It doesn't say where Susan is from, but she's touched on a, a comment that she gave that I think a lot of people are thinking about. She said, after months and months of COVID and the election, this book was so refreshing to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't want it to end. And that's the mark of an excellent book. I loved it. So during this COVID lockdown, how have you spent time? Have you um, polished up this book that has just been released or have you started working on other projects? Well, first of all, Susan, I'll send you the Cadillac. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, <laughs> I have been doing basically what all, all of us have been doing. Um, I have been, I finished the book right when COVID hit. And so I've been very, I, I had uh, pneumonia about four or five years ago. So I have to be careful and I'm of a certain age. So I don't go anywhere. Uh, I've just been, you know, missing people. And one of the sad things about this particular book, and I'm so happy to see everybody, you have no idea, is that I miss so much because I always come home every time I have a book. I start my book tour in Birmingham and then go to Atlanta and all around there. I come home. And so this year I wasn't able to come home. But thanks to you fabulous five, I'm able to at least visit with some of my favorite people. So that's good. And, uh, you know, it may, it's, uh, I'm just lonesome for people. I didn't know how much I loved them until I couldn't hug them. Well, we're glad you're here with us tonight, but this comment is great. You'll love it. Shelly Marsh says that she made barbecue tonight in honor of the occasion. She <laughs> assured Fanny it's made of pork, not person. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and then Linda Friesland wants to know what makes Fanny laugh? What makes you laugh? Me? Well, it's, it's just the, the crazy thing that people, the things that people do. And, you know, I'm a people watcher. I, I, I'm, I, bird watchers are one thing, but I look at people and I used to go out to, you know, this is awful, but I used to go out to the mall. Okay. And I would just see people doing the funniest things and the rigs that people get into them nowadays. You know, I don't know what these outfits are. I look, you know, I see people with all these strange things on. I don't know what's going on. And I have y'all seen the, the new fashion magazines? It looks like stuff that I would put on that my mother would say, you cannot go out of this house in that. <laughs> and it's thousands of dollars. So I don't know. It's a... Uh, you know, it's, if we, things have, we're, so, it's gotten so terrible this this year. We've had such bad luck with all kinds of crazy stuff going on. If you don't laugh, you'll just jump off the top of a building. So, you know, we've got to, we've got to remember that, you know, it, yeah, it's, we've got to keep our sense of humor because 
if we don't, you know, it's downhill and I don't want to be depressed. So one, that's one of the reasons I wrote this book because I wanted people to remember that there's a lot of wonderful things happening in the world. Terrific people, you know, lovely things going on. It's not all, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff, but we've got to balance it. And that's what I wanted to do is put that, you know, remind people and myself, not, not yeah. you know, myself that, you know, People are out there living their lives, doing wonderful things for each other, and they don't get any credit. And right. I, I just love, you know, uh, the, how brave people are. It's not easy being a human being. And people are so brave. They get up, they get dressed, they go to work, they try hard. And, you know, God bless them. Word that I, I see in all, all of your books um, it's, it's every man. It's yeah. the, it's the sweet aid in the nursing home. Mm -hmm. Good. The teachers. Yeah. The teachers good to Nanny Threadgood. And, and, um, uh, it's, I think that's a recurring thread through your stories that we can all see that, um, obviously you're someone who loves people and not just famous people and not Kardashians, but the folks running the fill-in station and, yeah. Real people. Yeah. And the thing yeah. that I thought that rang true, and maybe it's because of the pandemic and the election. I mean, it's just been such a hard time. Mm -hmm. the, your characters in this book did the random acts of kindness. You know, there was a lot of people looking out for one another. Mm -hmm. And even Evelyn seeing Ruthie as who she used to be, which I mm -hmm. loved that. Yeah. And, all, you know, the finding of the prosthetic arm, the little kindnesses. Yeah that made you just feel good reading it, yes. you know? Yes. Well, well thank you. I, thank you. I, I'm always touched by that. I'm always, you know, the, the fact, and it happens every day, that uh, a total stranger will jump into a river to save another person they've right. never met before. I mean, it's th these little things that never get any attention, and they're going on all day long. You know, in every nursing home, their kindness is all day long. And, uh, well, I appreciate it. Listen, uh, I, as I mentioned earlier to you gals, I, I had pneumonia and I wound up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And you want to talk about learning how much you uh, uh, depend on other people. Right, yeah. If you ever think you're, you're you know, you're self-sufficient, uh-uh. And uh, we need each other so much. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I know that. And, and um, you know, Fanny, um, I was thinking about uh, a lot of your books. Food is a, another thread running through the books. And I know that you read, you wrote the cookbook. Mm -hmm. and you, now, do you cook? No. <laughs> <laughs> I go out to eat. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, my, listen, my cooking is so pitiful. And I, I mess up the kitchen so bad, badly that I just go, oh. But the cookbook, just so you know, uh, this is called the original Whistle Stop Cafe cookbook. Those are the recipes right. that were from the original cafe. Right. Uh, the lady that bought the cafe from my aunt had all those recipes. And she's the one that, that really cooks and does the stuff and just so you know so you won't be poisoned uh southern living is a big a test kitchen there in birmingham yay and okay. they they test tested everything so it's safe. nobody died nobody died and and uh you know except for in the making of the barbecue <laughs> yeah, yeah. of course it's not it's not california cuisine you know with they give you one green bean and a half of, of something right. But, There's uh, the cookbook. Yeah, There's it's. Cookbook it's right I don't there. know how healthy the food is, but it sure is good. Well, they've got. I understand they've got uh, lots of copies at Page and Palette, so folks um, can call and order a cookbook, and they'll ship it to them or put it on the Pony Express or or whatever it takes. Do we have time for another question? We've got one more comment that's very nice, and it's about the current book that's out now. Tina D said, "I cried when I started reading the Wonder Boy of Whistle Stop." Every character that came back in the book was like finding an old friend after not having seen them in years. And that's kind of what you were just talking about, the niceness of people and remembering good memories. But that sums up this new book. And um, we'll, we'll let Fanny say a few words and then I'll close this out from there. 
Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. That's what I wanted to do is I wanted to bring them back and, you know, revisit them one more time and bring them into the future because we can't, we can't live in the past, but we can bring it with us to create a new future. And I also want to say I am in awe of all you your accomplishments are just fantastic, the five of you, and you do a beautiful show. And I'm really honored to have been on it. And um, I wish you happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and let's have the best year ever next year. Okay. Well, we're gonna, have, we're gonna have a reboot of Fried Green Tomatoes, aren't we? With yes. Rachel McIntyre. <laughs> yes, you know yes, we're hoping so, yes. That, that's another uh, wonderful thing that-, that, that Hooray! That, that, oh my gosh. gosh. She's wonderful. She's, she's, she's a darling. That's it's going to be a television show? Uh, NBC is uh, in the works for NBC series and uh, she will play, uh, it's, it'll be in, in modern times and she will play the new Iggy. Oh. And uh, so, that's, um, uh, she, I that's think gonna be a great job yeah yeah that would wow. be great and have you met Reba McIntyre already yes I was lucky that? enough I, I had uh, had a really first meeting with her she came out to California we had lunch and uh and we you know we were in touch and we go to meetings and she is uh, absolutely terrific mm -hmm. and she also has she has a production company I don't know if you knew that or not I didn't and she's also quite interested in doing the all girls filling station oh, that, would be oh, that and, would be good yeah and I just if I have two seconds I was going to tell you how how lucky that book is uh, I, I called the cafe and I was talking to Mrs. McMichael who ran it, who's running it now and we were on the phone and I was asking her something about a recipe or something and she said to me, I was in California and I called her and she picked up the phone at the cafe and she said, oh Fanny, she said, I wish you were here today and I said, well why? She said, well we've got a group of wasps that are having lunch out here. Right? They're here on a reunion. And I went, wasps? <laughs> what, what do you mean? And she said, well, they're ladies that flew in the Second World War. I said, well, I didn't even know there were ladies that flew in the Second World yeah. War. She yeah. said, oh, yes, and they're here on a reunion. And I said, well, tell them I thank them for their service and let me, you know, uh, tell them I'm, thank you, thank you. And so they started sending me their books. And I was fascinated. So that book came out of the cafe too. So oh. that cafe is pretty lucky. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. This all comes together. Well, we thank you all for being here tonight. This has been amazing. And it's the Friends in Fiction on Facebook with their Facebook Live group. Don't forget to look for Friends in Fiction. And that includes the awesome Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, yeah. Mary Alice Monroe, Christy Woodson Harvey and Patty Callahan Henry. And on behalf of all the fabulous people at Page and Palette, we wish you all thank you for coming and shopping for over 40 years they've been there. Oh, wow. I know that Fanny was good friends with the founder. Yes. And Eddie yeah, Joe Wolf. Yes, and we miss her dearly in Fairhope. Yeah. And but they're continuing her legacy there. And it's the heartbeat of the city. And they do ship for Christmas. So if you need anything by any of these wonderful authors tonight, they will be happy to ship it anywhere in the world. Just give them a call, Google them, and look up Page and Palette Bookstore in Fairhope, Alabama. And on behalf of the great Page and Palette, we thank you for joining us tonight, everyone. And we wish you happy holidays and all the joy in the world. Thank you. And now before you rush off, <laughs> We'd like to encourage everyone out there to switch to gallery view. Oh, that's right. Unmo unmute your microphones. And we're going to raise a glass, if you have a glass, and toast Fanny and her new book, The Wonder Boy of the Whistle Stop. Late or you didn't get the link properly, we have taped uh, the Zoom tonight, and we um, we'll make it available. 
Yay. Oh, this was such a great Good night news. to see you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you all. Nice to meet you, Danny. Thank you. 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 Is Danny still on there? Did you hear it? Yeah. We're going to get our day. Five other, yeah, I don't know any of these authors are like five.